Dr. Drake J. Busen is a D-Optum, Fellow of Scleral Lens Education Society, and he holds uh, ocular therapeutic privilege in South Africa, Nambia, New Zealand, and USA. Currently, he is having private practice with part-time teaching po position at several universities in South Africa. He is an independent consultant to Boss Alum, SLR, Jais, Johnson & Johnson, Alcon in South Africa. He has presented several papers in national and international conference and also published textbook on clinical contact lens practice in August 2018. Welcome, sir. <laughs> hello, sir. Thank you very much. And thanks for the kind <laughs> invite. And I just wanted to say hello to my friend Tom Arnold, who I see is also lecturing later on, on, on today's proceedings. Let me just um, share my slideshow with you. Yes, sir. You can share your slides. I'm going to share them. Let me just get them open. Okay, guys, this is quite a quite a big lecture, so I'm going to try and stay in your time constraints, but I might uh, run over time a moment, so please excuse me for it. It's something which I just um, read, read last year or the beginning of the year, and it makes a lot of sense to me. So I'm titling it Age-Related Macular Degeneration versus Diet-Related Macular Degeneration, and it's from a medical hypothesis I read, which is very interesting. Okay, so let's just carry on with the slides. All right, so we, what we know about AMD is it's one of the leading causes of blindness in the world. So people over 65 years of age is most common in whites and females, and it causes irreversible vision loss. So roughly about 5% of global blindness is the result of AMD, and it's the third most common cause of global blindness after cataract and glaucoma. However, in high-income countries, AMD has replaced cataracts as the most common cause of blindness. So as of 2020, about nearly 200 million people worldwide had this. And by 2040, this will probably be close to 300 million, which means about one in every 11 adults in the world will have AMD, which is quite, quite a frightening statistic if you, if you think about it. From the older textbooks that we used to look at, they had the two forms, the wet and the dry form, and the dry form was... Uh, a result of thinning of uh, macular tissues and, and these deposits that you get on Brooks membrane and pigmentation in the macula. And with a wet form, we obviously know there's choroidal vas vascular membranes and these things leak into the retina and it causes serious damage to the retina. Retina is blood's very toxic to the retina, believe it or not. So when we start looking at some of the newer definitions, it's now defined as the loss of the RPE and photoreceptors. Now, very interestingly is that your rods and cones have the highest metabolic activity of any cells in the body. And this is closely followed by the RPE. So what this requires is an excellent blood supply, lots of oxygen, lots of nutrients um, for it to function. So in AMD, some of the studies have now shown that the choriocopularis blood volume and blood flow is substantially reduced. Bruce's membrane thickens and calcifies. With age, secondary, these basal laminar deposit or drusen, which is more severe in AMD. And now, this then leads to diminished transfer of these nutrients and waste products across the membrane. So, it affects the health of the tissue. And it also, there's something called vitamin K2 and a deficiency of vitamin K2, which is a fat-soluble vitamin, plays a significant role in the calcification of the soft tissues of not only Bruch's membrane, but the coronary vessels as well. So, there's some links here that's coming out now and about, about cardiovascular disease and AMD. So still to this day, um, AMD's cause is really not known. And the statement that was made by uh, in Albert and Jacobic's uh, textbook, Practice of Ophthalmology, says there, the cause of AMD is unknown, so we lack the means of its prevention. And this was said in 1944, and still we are not sure what really causes AMD. 
We know the risk factors, smoking, family history, hyperopia, drusen, advanced age, RPE changes, cardiovascular disease, blood pressure, obesity, metabolic syndrome. These things are all risk factors for MD. But these risk factors are also the effects of an healthy diet and really lifestyle issues, which causes metabolic syndrome. So when you really look at AMD to understand it, what we need to do is, is actually think about our overall health as well in the picture. So this lecture aims to explore the hypothesis which simply states processed nutrient deficient foods, including vegetable oils, artificially created trans fats, refined flour and sugar, and invented foods all displace these nutrient-rich, natural, organically raised animal and plant foods causing the metabolic syndrome and eventually AMD. So let's start with that. Now, to really look at this in context, we have to go back a few years. Now, the ophthalmoscope was invented by Helmholtz in 1851. So from 1851, ophthalmologists and, and eye care practitioners had the ability to look in the back of the eye. And the electric ophthalmoscope appeared in the 1880s already. So there's been a lot of time for people to look at the back of the eye. Now, you'll tell me, well, it's not such a great instrument. Um, you know, how could they see the back of the eye? Well, let me put it to you this way, that these guys were very good observers. And they would often spend hours with their patients observing the back of the eye and making sketches. So they were probably better observers than we are because we depend too much on technology. So since 1851, uh, the ability to look at the back of the eye. So Paulus de Jong wrote an article which he went and looked at, at where um, AMD sort of first of all appeared. So he says, only since 1970, we know substantially more about aging macular disorder. However, he discovered the first descriptions of AMD, although in a different name, appeared in 1852. But it took over a century and a half before a clearer conception of AMG emerged and its high prevalence as well as its impact on the quality of life of many elderly people who appreciate it. So this raises the question, why do the Atlas's textbooks and journals of the 19th century fail to mention AMD? And if you go through this, quite a busy slide, but the, the gist of it is that by 1930, there was in Diseases of the Eye written by May, only one sentence on AMD. This is after 80 years of ophthalmic history following the invention of the ophthalmoscope. 1937, for Hoof and Grossman, they had 84 patients which they review which had disciform degeneration. 1940, Duke Elder, the famous Duke Elder, reported report in his famous textbook that AMD was a common cause of vision loss in the elderly. 58, 1958, Sorsby addressed the etiology of AMG, stating that factors other than a simple senile change is hard work. Then by 1966, Duke Elder's textbook reported 25% of people between the age of 65 and 80 had AMD, and 30 to 40% over the age of 80 had it. He also then said, infective or toxic influences of a chronic nature may be at fault and recommended an abundance of vitamins associated with nicotinic acid. So after 1966, we know there's a lot of studies on AMD, Framingham study, the Copenhagen City study, the Beaver Dam study, and they all showed a prevalence of 30% of the population over 75 at AMD. So the question now is why was it never reported in the early 1900s or since they had the ophthalmoscope? We only started hearing about it 1930 onwards. So this raises some fundamental questions on the prevalence of AMD. So we've been told it's age-related. If it's age-related, shouldn't it have affected the elderly the same a century or 150 years ago it's doing now? If AMD is a genetic condition, shouldn't it be as prevalent a century ago or more as it is now? Or do you think our genetics have changed? So if you look at the AMD age-related business, AMD is repeatedly connected to vascular disease of the choroid, an altered or thickened Bruch's membrane, degeneration of the RP, and loss of the photoreceptors. And now the question for me is, how does this tie in with our diet? And we'll get to that shortly. How about our genetics? The current AMD epidemic cannot be due to faulty genes, which have a stable prevalence over a long period of time. However, our genes have an influence on, on, on its susceptibility. And this now introduces a new field of study, which is called epigenetics. And this arose in the, in the, in the 1990s. And all that epigenetics says is that our genes can be influenced by our environment. 
And an AMD guy is probably by our diet. So you can always go and read. I would suggest reading N N Nessa Carey's book. You can download it for free. And it'll give you a lot of information of epigenetics. So what changed in 1880, roundabout? Let's have a look. And this is where we introduce the displacing foods. What are the displacing foods? First of all, refined flour, which has started production in the 1880s. And what the guys did, they had the roller mill technology then. So they rolled the wheat and they got rid of the whole wheat and they came up with a white flour. And this is a nutrient deficient white flour. Vegetable oil production started um, in 1880 and rapidly increased over the 1900s. And this replaced the animal fats, which are rich in fat soluble vitamins and omega 3s, with, with stuff that really doesn't have that and has omega 6 in. And then Procter and Gamble came up with this hydrogenated vegetable oils or trans fat invention, which is a, a supposedly healthy alternative to um, animal fats. And this increased consumption of sugar, which started in 1822, replaced nutrient dense foods such as whole wheat, grains, and fruits and vegetables in the diet. So we know AMD runs parallel with heart disease, obesity, cancer, and diseases associated with and diet. And if I look at what the, what the Blue Mountains Eye study found, they found that AMD predicts cardiovascular mortality. People aged between 49 and 70 with AMD at baseline had a doubling of cardiovascular mortality over the next decade. So there's a very close link between the two. So if you've got AMD, you're probably going to have cardiovascular disease. If you've got cardiovascular disease, you're probably going to have AMD. What's the Western diet? Now, the Western diet means the following. 24% of your calories that you consume per day is from vegetable oil. 20% from wheat, which is mostly white flour. 26% from added sugars in the form of sucrose and high fructose corn syrup which is 70% of your diet comes from these nutrient deficient foods of modern commerce. And that leads to metabolic syndrome. What leaves, what's left now is 30% of all your calories consumed during a day as to provide for all your nutritional requirements that your body needs. So whenever processed foods are consumed, AMD shows up. However, it just takes time, which is about 30 to 40 years. And that makes a lot of sense for our prevalence that's rising in the 30s. This graph is just an illustration of the saturated fat consumption in the United States from 1900 to 2020. And you can see it's quite a flat line, which is the purple line. So the saturated fat or animal fat consumption didn't go up much. What did go up was vegetable oil consumption. So vegetable oils are being used more and more, and they're hid, hidden away in a lot of processed foods. Look at what happened to heart disease deaths. It sort of runs parallel with the consumption of vegetable oils. So it's a little bit of food for thought there. Metabolic syndrome is a strong predictor of developing heart disease as well as type 2 diabetes and is conclusively associated with AMD. What is metabolic syndrome? Abdominal obesity, arthrogenic dyslipidemia, elevated LDL and low HDLs, elevated blood pressure, insulin resistance with or without glucose intolerance, pro-inflammatory state, pro-thrombic state, and tendency to clot as, as an heart attacks. How about inflammation? We know in Drusen and other metabolic deposits, the level of Bruce membrane, they contain proteins which are associated with acute and chronic forms of inflammation. I've often said to my students, I don't have any eye disease that's not an, got an inflammatory component to it. We also know that C-reactive protein, protein, which is an inflammatory marker, is associated with higher risk of AMD. Inflammation has also been tied to coronary artery disease. That's no wonder. So how is it linked to our diet? Okay, diets high in refined sugars, flour, vegetable oil, processed foods, leads to disturbed gut health. And then inflammation crops up in remote areas of the body, such as the vessels of the heart and the eye. How about omega-3 and 6? Now, I'm not going to go into detail here. Just to say that omega-3 has anti-inflammatory effects, and it comes from, guess what? Fish, grass-fed cattle, and beef, cheese, whole milk, nuts, and seeds. Omega-6 is pro-inflammatory, and it's converted to arachidonic acid, and you all know where that goes in the inflammatory cycle. This is a mediated to inflammation. Where do you get omega-6 from? You get it from vegetable oils. Right, so the issue with omega-3 and 6 is the ratio in the body. Ideal ratio is 1 to 1. But the Western diet is a ratio of 15 to 1 and 16.7 to 1. 
which then contribute to inflammatory disorders. Um, I don't think we need to say too much more there. Okay. So how is omega-3 and AMD linked? Okay. So this is from the ARED research. They clearly showed that higher consumption of omega-3 reduces the risk of developing wet AMD. And people with in the top 20% that cons consumed omega-3 were 40% less likely to develop AMD. And the top 20% of, of omega-6 consumption, they're one and a half times more likely to, to develop wet AMD. So high omega-3, specifically DHA consumption, had the most protective effect to wet AMD. And finally, people in the top 20% of dietary vegetable fat intake have 2.22 times higher risk of AMD than those in the bottom 20%. Right, so how is vegetable oil linked to all of this? All right, so you get inflammation secondary to high omega-6 fatty acid consumption because of the arachidonic acid link. So these polyunsaturated oils deposit onto the low-density lipoproteins or the LDL, the bad cholesterol molecules. These cholesterol molecules then oxidize, and these reactive molecules deposits into the arterial walls, causing atherosclerosis, and eventually AMD, which is a, a link to the occlusion of these blood vessels. Also, by displacing animal fats rich in the fat-soluble vitamins A, D, and K2, especially K2, which prevents calcification of Bruch's membrane and also the arterial walls, it leads to death of the RB and the photoreceptors. Um, let's see the next slide there. How about sugar? Now, the problem with sugar is it replaces nutrients in your diet with empty calories. So you get sucrose, which is table sugar. It's a 50-50 mix of fructose and glucose. And then corn syrup is a 55-44 thing. Remember, sucrose then breaks down in the gut into glucose, which your body really can use, as well as fructose. But the problem is lying with the fructose, which has to be broken down in the liver into uric acid, which blocks the production of nitric oxide. Remember, nitric oxide is important. Accumulation also leads to inflammation, which causes things like gout. And eventually, fractals also is converted to fat. In, and these fats stay in the liver or they can get deposited somewhere in the body. So a high fructose diet leads to high triglycerides, increased blood sugar, fat deposits, insulin resistance, which are all markers for metabolic syndrome. So what about sugar and AMD? There's also a direct effect. Aside from you know, resulting in insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome, which are links to AMD, it's also a direct effect. So the high blood sugar can cause advanced glycation, end products, AGEs in the tissue. And these proteins accumulate in Bruch's membrane and Drusen, causes thickening, lack of permeability, and ultimately destruction of the outer retina. So fructose glycates more readily than glucose. So we don't have one fructose in our diet. And now we get to white flour. Okay, so anywhere, pretty much anywhere, white flour shows up in the world, metabolic havoc ensues. So that roller mill technology of the 1880s created nutrient-deficient white flour. It removed all the bran, the germ, which contains the vitamins, the fiber, omega-3, omega-6, leaving only the starchy white endosperm and some protein. Now, the protein is gluten. And we all know about gluten, gluten in the diet. Some people are very sensitive to it and it causes inflammation. While whole grain reduces the risk of heart uh, arrest or tax, diabetes, cancers, and obesity, white flour in the form of wheat increases metabolic syndrome and AMD. And remember, wheat's also sprayed with many herbicides um, in the modern world, which can also have detrimental effects. This little graph just illustrates our point again where vegetable oil and is consumed in huge quantities. And you can see this is the United States. Look at their sugar consumption. It's gone up from the 1880s to 2020, and the harmful vegetable oil is going up. And the green bars, they illustrate what happened to AMD. So the prevalence of AMD is just skyrocketing. And it started in the 1970s and went up and up. While you look at a place like Kiribati, which is a small island nation, their sugar consumption is pretty a flat line. They don't take much vegetable oil, so they, use, cook, uh, they cook their food and, and animal fats, and their prevalence of AMD is very low. So what do we do? Jack LaLanne was a fitness expert from the, from the 80s and, 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 the, and the United States, says if it's man-made, don't eat it. So avoid white flour, avoid sugar, 
Avoid polyunsaturated vegetable oils, oils, avoid trans fats from hydrogenated vegetable oils, and avoid processed food, which has normally got a mix of the previous four in it. So if it's more than three ingredients in it, don't eat it. So what should we eat? Organ meat such as liver, at least once a week, which is a great source of vitamins and nutrients. Cod liver oil on a daily basis. Fish when available, six to 12 weeks per week, uh, one or two a day. Fruit and vegetables of various colors every day. Raw dairy milk in the form of cows, from cows grazing on green grass, nuts and seeds in small quantities. Cook your food and butter or animal fat, no vegetable oils. Never take synthetic vitamins. That's a whole lecture on its own, but let me just give you a brief overview of a Cochrane analysis of 78 studies showed people that took synthetic vitamins at a higher death rates um, than people that didn't consume these synthetic vitamins. Exercise regularly and try to get off your medication as your health improves, and then obviously get enough sleep seven to eight hours per night. I'm sure this will raise quite a lot of questions. You're welcome to email me. And sorry that I ran over time. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It was lovely to have you. And we had a very great session with you.